Hi, hi. Uh, my name is Tom Rogus, and uh, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And I started uh, by being drafted. I was going to UND, and my number was really low. So uh, my advisor told me that, being that I was in, enrolled in engineering, uh, he said if you want to become a uh, good engineer, you should enlist for the machinist training in Aberdeen, Maryland. And I did that and I got accepted, but I had to go in for three years and I got the machinist training and it didn't make any difference. I ended up in Vietnam. Well, did you, you were drafted from Stephen, Minnesota? From, yeah, from and, St Stephen, Minnesota, lived in Marshall County. And then, and then you went. You you must have went to basic training, right? I went to basic training in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Fort where? Fort Bliss. Fort Bliss, Texas. Okay. Yeah. And after that, uh, went to the machinist training in Aberdeen. But what was what was basic training like for you? Basic training was what you call real basic training. It's <laughs> you didn't know anyone. Well, I went. I didn't know anyone. And it, they, they tried to assimilate things like for Vietnam. They tried to make it real miserable and <laughs> eat really fast so you could eat in one minute, uh, open up a can of sea rations. And uh, I learned how to eat really fast. <laughs> so, so what's some of the things you did? I mean, basic was... Basic training was, uh, you know, like uh, your... You went through the crawl uh, with machine gun fire over your head underneath the concertina wires. And uh, you try to go, <laughs> uh, just make it through, don't make any screw ups. It's uh, really all basic training is, is try to uh, be able to take commands, you know. You go to a tear gas chamber at all, or? Oh yeah, tear gas and then grenades and all that stuff. It was all. Uh, it was. Uh, it was quite an experience. It's. Uh, it's an experience that I think that uh, everyone would benefit from. I think uh, you you have to be obedient, and uh, it's just the way it is. I guess it's. Uh, it's what made our country strong. Okay. And then after that, uh, I went to uh, went to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland at the 16-week machinist training school. Did they fly you there? Or? Uh, yeah, we, we flew over there. First went home and then flew from home. We, you we had got to come break. home after basic training? After basic training, you had a two-week, I think, leave or I don't remember exactly how long it was. But uh, after Aberdeen, Maryland, uh, uh, which was a really good school. It was a very, um, uh, really good type of school. And it was, uh, it kind of weeded out um, some students that didn't make the classes, you know, that, didn't, uh, that weren't uh, cut out for machinist schools. So uh, it was, uh, it was a really good experience. I, I really can thank, uh, you know, my advisor from UND. That's the one that kind of set the course, I guess, to where I, where I am now. So how long was that school? 16 weeks. So it's a three-month school. So it was a very, very good school. Uh, then, so uh, when did you get your orders? To go to Vietnam was that out after that school or yeah after the school we got the orders to go to Vietnam so I never thought I you know uh, I got the orders and the orders were to go with the first air cavalry which uh, I would have never thought that a machinist would go with the first air cavalry but we had a little truck uh, a little deuce and a half truck and that's this is in Vietnam? In Vietnam. Well, okay, you must have come home from AIT, right? Yeah, from AIT, went for leave and then 
And then you then you went to after leave you went to Oakland or I, uh, Fort Dix Fort you Fort Dix um, New Jersey to go and, to Vietnam yeah really oh. yeah and then we flew to Alaska from there we flew to Alaska and then we flew into Vietnam and I remember getting off the plane in Vietnam my first step. When I got out of the plane, it was really hot and humid. And the first step I made out, one year. I was thinking of that right away. One year in this heat, in this really different type of climate. You Humidity, know. yep. So, but a guy was young, so you could get acclimated to it. It didn't take long. You, you figured out that you just go with the rest of the deal here. <laughs> and... Uh, what happened so, was... So you flew into... What, uh, ben on K. On K? Yeah, to On K. And then we were there for about, uh, not very long, because after that, the Tet Offensive came on in, I think that was in June. 68. In 68. Yep. The Tet Offensive. And uh, what happened is the first air cab was moved north. And I remember I we were supposed to get on a plane. It was kind of a really rush order. We we're supposed to all get on a plane, pack us in as fast as we could. And I'm the only one that got on the plane from our company. And I ended up in Da Nang. And when I got off, I had my bag and my orders with, but there was nobody. Uh, nobody that I knew. And I didn't know who to go, who, where to go, or I was in Da Nang, and all these service people were in Da Nang. And it was just, uh, just a mess. I mean, there were Navy people there, there were Army people, there were some Navy people. Air Force. And I would go around and, first of all, to get something to eat. So I'd go to any mess hall that was available and tell them why I was. And they just invited me in and I ate there. And I didn't know how I was going to get out of there. I didn't know. I had to meet up with my, with my unit. And uh, I met up with the first sergeant that I had in basic training in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. And he, <laughs> he said uh, they were with the Big Red One. And from there, he says, come on, I'll get you where you got to go. He said, come with us, he said. Well, what I didn't know is they were getting on, and they got on to, these, to the boats to the go across the Red China, the China Sea, South China Sea. And it's a three-day trip on LSTs, and uh, of course, I was never on it. I was never in the boats. And we were at a three-day trip across. It was during the monsoon season, and it was really rough. The, the, it was really rough that these could take up to a 30-degree tilt. These, these boats could take up to a 30-degree tilt. And uh, we were all sicker than dogs when we got there. And uh, when we got to the shore, we were met, uh, the guys that were there were the Marines with M14s. They didn't even have M16s, they had M14s at that time. And we were all just like really, really weak because this, this this trip across the sea, we were not, we were all army guys, we weren't navy people. So it was, it was a difficult. So when we got there, they were going to serve us lunch because we were just not 10 miles from the DMZ. Where was there? Is there, is there a there was just village a, or? Just a, no, there was right in the open. There was nothing there. It was just in the open. They had a camp made there and and they were going to serve us lunch, and as soon as they were serving us lunch, we had incoming rounds coming in from the North, North Vietnam. 
So that's disbanded everything and we went out on a, the part of the unit went out, they went out on a convoy, they broke ranks there and went to the convoy and there was six of us that flew to Camp Evans where the first air cav was with. And I remember when we were going there, we get incoming rounds from through the bottom of the helicopter and that one just came really close to one of the guys was the six of us sitting in the in the Chinook. It was a Chinook that we had there that they flew across there. And uh, when we got to Camp Evans, it, they just had the camp just kind of set up there. So a lot of sandbagging, a lot of a lot of work, a lot of uh, uh, guard duty. Uh, the amount of machinist work that was hardly nothing. It what was, was the name of the camp? Camp Evans. Camp Evans, okay. Yeah, Camp Evans in Vietnam. And during that stay, like I say, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, lot, there was a lot of uh, guard duty. There were breaking the perimeter every now and then. So you'd have to get, you had to get okay to shoot, but Nothing really happened. We saw an awful lot of ground fire at night. There was just a lot of, a lot of... Tracers. Uh, a lot of uh, planes flying they had with the, with the guns on them and a lot of airstrikes there in that part of the country. And then one day, and we had artillery too, so you'd have to, when you were, artillery was there, so you'd have to determine if you heard the boom, and then, or if it was, and then the boom. So that was a big difference. So you knew when you got incoming rounds or when you didn't have the incoming rounds. And then uh, our ammo dump got hit, and it was all it. We had detonation for three days because a lot of these were timed uh, rounds that were in the ammo dump. And it was really a scary time. That was the time Hanoi Hanna was on, on the radio, trying to discourage all the troops. And some, some guys listened to this, but you know, they were, they, we knew that was kind of bunk, but that's, that wasn't going on. So it was uh, a lot of activity there at, at Camp Evans, a lot of helicopters, a lot of, uh, lot of infantry stuff going on, and an awful lot of guard duty. I never had to go out out of the camp because they needed they needed some repair stuff for for machinist type work or something that broke down, but usually it wasn't that much. So so what kind of machinery did you work on? We just we just had laid and, and drill presses and some welders and it wasn't it was very bare bones. But the so. equipment you worked on was it. Tanks oh or? no! It'll be like small, small parts, small um, repair, uh, something that broke or a screw that broke or something to take out or something to fix. It was never mm -hmm. no, nothing very big. We didn't have very big equipment in there, so that's part of the part of the MOS that we were in. But it was. Uh, uh, it's quite experience. Um, you were a machinist, but you still pulled guard duty. Oh yeah, and protected the perimeter. I'm guessing during during that during when the ammo dump went off. I remember, I remember I was running, and I got um, there was a blast. I bet that blast picked me up and made me two threw me about. 15 feet or so, right in midair, right against the Mokan. We had flak vests and we had helmets on and everything. And that guy was younger, so you could take the deal. You, you were so, your adrenaline was so high that you didn't even feel anything. So it was uh, quite experience. Uh, the one thing, people have no clue how good they got it here. Uh, we, we've seen... Uh, been a lot of times two weeks before you ever even wash up, even have a shower, and it would be out of a swamp water. Uh, just, uh, I mean, if you got a shower once a week, that was pretty good. So, and uh, hot, miserable, 
and yet seemed like the most of the guys around were pretty good natured. They still they would get us beer every now and then, even if it was warm, you had beer. <laughs> so that's kind of how it was, and it was, uh, uh, like I say, people have no idea how good they have it here. Uh, third world countries, we went on a, um, on, we went down the road from one town to the next town, one time it was on a little count. I was a little mission. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't. Uh, it was kind of a friendly thing, and uh, one of the guys had to go to the bathroom. So we all, few of us, decided to go to the bathroom. We were in a deuce and a half truck. Came out, and these little Vietnamese kids were follow us for our sea rations, and. Uh, they asked the toilet, the bathroom, bathroom. They understood what he meant. They pointed at us out in the field. And you went out in the field where you were just wondering. They said, no, over there, over there. Well, pretty soon, when you start going over, you found out you have to be careful where you stepped because you could step on somebody else's uh, poop. <laughs> and, and what it was in that field, it didn't make men, women, and children they all pulled their pants down, they went in the same place, and there was no toilet paper. Uh, everything you did was on your own. And they didn't think anything of it. I mean, that was just a way of life. That's just the way it was. That's a third world country. And, and what, what surprised me a lot is how cheerful a lot of these people were. They were not they were not complaining, they were not, they were just kind of a more easygoing, you know, and, a, and, and you began to wonder, you know, what, what is this, you know, it's kind of the way it is, and uh, I... Um, They've been fighting for so long that... Yeah, it's been, been yeah, it's just been the way it is, and what I noticed there too, uh, where I was at in a rural, in an agriculture area, there, the women were doing all the work, uh, they had the water buffalo there. They were they were doing the rice patties with the water buffalo, and the women were. And these men, what I saw, these men, I I don't know if half of them were gone in the service or where they were, you know, because there was war going on in the country, you know. But uh, I I thought it was uh, noble of these South Vietnamese. We had a lot of really nice people, you know, and they're all nice people all over, you know, but. Uh, it's uh, that's the sad thing about war, you know. There's good people fighting good people, you know. That's really what ends up being, you know. How long were you in Camp Evans? Were you there Camp the Evans is probably a good, maybe, ten months, maybe so nine, ten months. Yeah. You spent, did you ever go on R and R? Or? Yeah, to Australia. We went to R and R Australia. Spent a week in Australia then. And a week in Australia, yeah. Yeah, which was a really a nice break. Um, it how, was. But how long were you in country when you went there? For for a week. I mean, how long were you in country before you got to go on R and R? Oh, I was I was almost I was almost there for eleven months. I mean, I was there for a long time before you I got, got to go. Yeah, I didn't have a whole lot left after I got back. So it was uh, quite experience. It was, but it's. Uh, it's um, it actually was a blessing because it, you really begin to realize uh, don't complain. We have nothing to complain about. Absolutely nothing. Compare that to what these people have. Um, you you know our daily living and what we have, the material goods we have, the access that we have to everything and the freedom that we have right now are tremendous, you know. So uh, I would do everything possible to to have our freedom like we have today, you know, and we got to fight for it, so. And that's one of the reasons you were there. Yeah, that's the reason we were there, all about, it was all about freedom. How, how the war started and all that, nobody really knows, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, we just thought we were fighting communism, and that's what really basically the whole thing was, so.
so so you spent your how did where did you fly out of uh, when you left when we left uh, I don't remember I don't remember for sure Benoit or Benoit's could probably yeah. yep and when you got on that freedom bird and it got in the air anybody cheer or anything huh yeah yeah very happy very happy yeah and, and what was your route back uh the route back uh, i think we ended up i don't remember i wonder if we didn't go to washington to but did you stop in like japan or yeah i don't i don't even recall that I guess just glad to be home. We're just on a high to get home. Yeah. So flew in. You got. So, were you uh, mustered out there, or did, were you done? No, no. Then I had to go. I had to finish my three years. So then I went to Fort Hood, Texas. First Ave. First, yeah, Fort Fort Hood, Texas, and. Uh, there worked uh, 47 maintenance company uh, and served out the rest of the term there. And that was... What that kind, was, of bar kind of barracks did you have there? Were they brick or wood or...? That was... A, that one I think was a wooden one. Yeah, but we had... I mean that... And, and when we got there, and if you were a veteran, Vietnam veteran, I was with a bunch of National Guard guys from uh, Hayes, Kansas, and we had a lot of fun. I mean, that was, that was, that was kind of fun, that, because they, if you little. were a veteran there, you kind of got by with a lot of stuff. <laughs> that was easy duty, really. How but long were you in Fort Hood? About nine months. You, so you yeah. finished your career. So I got an early out to go back to school. So three months early out to go back to school. So that's what that was all about. So during your time in the service, was there anything you'd have changed or didn't did, done different? Boy, I don't know. I uh, I. I don't know if I would have, I can't think of doing anything really different. I really can't. I, uh, I mean, I don't regret anything. I, uh, I saw, I saw a lot of mistreated, you know, like, uh, troops that were North Vietnamese, you know, I seen some of that stuff and it's all on emotion, you know, if, and these troops get on high and and you don't think straight a lot of times, you know. So they're kicking this, I mean, that wasn't necessary, you know. That kind of stuff wasn't, you know. But it, that's the way it is. That's what war is about. It's not fair, you know. There's nothing good about war, you know. Okay, so you, you got out of the service, came back to Stephen? Came back to U University of North Dakota to go into the engineering school, went for another year year to UND and then instead of finishing an engineering degree uh, it was really a kind of a really really slow time for engineering and everything and and I decided to go to a tool and die making school in uh, Dunwoody Institute in uh, in Minneapolis and there I uh, I learned a lot more about machinist work and becoming machinist stuff and ended up getting a nighttime job at Capital Gear in St. Paul, Minnesota, where they made uh, they made transmissions for Royal Royce yachts, the only ones that Lloyd's of London would guarantee. And I got to apprenticeship there. After, uh, during the time I was still going to Dunwoody, I got the apprenticeship there, and then I was finished with the Dunwoody, and then I worked there for about a year and a half, and uh, 
learned an awful lot there. I really had a lot of respect for these people and I, I really got to enjoy the machinist work. And, and during that time, uh, they went on strike and I was not going to wait for the strike to end. So I ended up going to a little machine shop out in, uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, that's got the idea for the business to start and that's how we started our business. What's the name of your business? Terog Manufacturing Company. How long have you been, how long have you been in business? 50 years. 50 years in business. Yeah. yeah. How many people do you employ, Tom? We got around 30. 30? Around 30. The way times are, are you having a hard time finding employees? Or? So far, we've been fortunate to have been able to find employees. Good. So, I mean, it, it isn't easy, but we have to work at it. And, and we've had, that's been a blessing to our company. We've had really good employees. And the town of Stephen. What's that? And the community. And the community too was wonderful to come to Stephen. They were very helpful in, in helping us come. We started um, the business in Minneapolis, but there was an opportunity here to buy the blacksmith shop and it started there and it's been a blessing ever since. Good. It's been a blessing. All of it's been a blessing. We, we don't realize it a lot of times, but it's a blessing. Everything's a blessing. Whether you think it's good or bad, it ends up being a blessing. So, is there anything else you'd like to add, Tom? To no, I just thank God for everything and everybody that I've met along the way. I've been helped by so many different people in so many different ways that I just can't thank God enough for everything. So, okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, appreciate you coming to this interview, and you're very strong and well known in the community, and. Thank you for your service. You're very welcome. Thank you.